It's the most wonderful webinar of the year. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it is the last webinar Wednesday of 2021 and what a year it has been. And we plan to go out with a bang. We brought out the big guns, rolled them out here. Dave Simpson is going to present to us on corrosion mitigation with embedded galvanic anodes for parking structures. Uh, but before we get going, just take a quick look back at the year. Um, we've uh, concluded our bridge preservation webinar series in July. There was a 12 month running series and uh, we took one one month off and went right back at it with our parking structure preservation series, which we're now in. So uh, if you want to look back at some of those some of those recordings or those slide decks, they're all at wesafestructures.com and uh, and on with the show. So as you probably know, the Concrete Preservation Alliance that hosts Webinar Wednesday is a committed group of, in, of uh, individual firms uh, that is committed to advancing best practices in the field of concrete preservation and infrastructure renewal. Uh, we have a number of members spread out across the globe, which is important because if we're going to save structures all across the globe, we need, need members. So here's all our members right here, you know, Vector Corrosion Technologies. Again, I'm my name is Scott and I'm, uh, I'm uh, a member of, of that team. And uh, Dave, our, our presenter today, is also uh, with Vector Corrosion Technologies. He's a colleague of mine. If you've gotten here today, you probably know where you registered, which is uh, wesafestructures.info, the home of the Concrete Preservation Alliance. Uh, under the Events tab, you'll find the Parking Structures series as well as the Bridge Preservation series. Uh, videos are available there of the recordings, um, the slide decks, and if you want to register for upcoming webinars, which we'll talk about later, uh, you can register there as well. So. The man of the hour, Dave Simpson. He's the Director of Operations for Vector Corrosion Technologies uh, in the UK. Uh, Dave holds a first class honors degree in chemistry and uh, biology from Aston University in Birmingham. Prior to working for Vector, he's held positions of corrosion product manager uh, for Fosrock International and technical manager at Fosrock Limited, uh, where he specialized in electrochemical repair methods and cement technology. Uh, Dave is uh, the foregoing chairman of the Corrosion Protection Association, a different CPA um, than the Concrete Preservation Alliance, and he's an i -Corps Level 4 Senior Cathodic Protection Engineer for Reinforced Concrete. Uh, one thing I know about Dave, and I mentioned that at our webinar this morning, is that he is a big fan of Christmas. So I'm really surprised uh, to see that Dave's not wearing his Santa hat today on video, um, but, uh, but uh, there it is. Dave, are you ready to take it away? I'm ready, my friend. Thank you very much for that introduction. There you okay. go. Oh, and again, I, I almost forgot again. For anybody who wants to ask a question, please submit it in the Q&A function in Teams Live event here. And for every person who answers us the question, essentially you're adding a ballot to the box to win a uh, Amazon gift card. Dave uh, will be selecting the best question from today's webinar, and we will send you that, that, uh, that gift card right away. So sorry. Thanks, Dave. No problem at all. Thanks, Scott. It's always strange when you hear somebody else introduce you, so I appreciate all the bigs up there, Scott. Um, the team asked me to pick a photograph of me on site, so I picked an archive footage one. Uh, this is a, a job, um, one of the very early Galva Shield embedded anode jobs that we have in the UK. It's probably circa 2003, I guess. I'm slightly uh, thinner in that picture. I have slightly more hair, but again, it's a bit of a legacy legacy photograph that, uh, that I have. I don't seem to get the site as much as I used to, uh, but again, there's just evidence of me actually being on site at some point in my life. Um, so I've been asked today to present on parking structures and in particular um, cathodic protection using galvanic anodes and targeted protection in particular, um, but I don't believe that we can talk about car parking structures or parking structures without really looking at the legacy issue that that exists around parking structures, where it came from, the impacts that have had on our, on our society and where we are left with today, really. So if we look at the sort of brief history of our towns and cities, really prior to the 1940s, the sort of mode of transport wasn't really car after the Second World War. That really did pick up in energy after the Second World War. And if we look at the sort of number of cars over the sort of last sort of like 50 um, years on that 60 years you can see that the mode of transport has increased now after the second world war especially in europe in particular obviously a lot of the towns and city were decimated and there was a massive increase in the sort of disposable income that people had and there was a massive cultural change towards fashion which led to a significant investment in these towns and cities and as people had more money they were spending more money they needed places for their cars to park and often 
in areas like towns and cities, space was a premium. So there seemed to be a big expansion in the in the sort of design and development of multi-story car parks around the world. Um, the problem we have from a legacy point of view is during this whole period of this mass expansion of, of, of construction, most people are unaware of the issue of corrosion of steel in concrete. So everybody thought that concrete was 100% durable. Obviously, it had impact issues. It had uh, things like fire damage that, that could cause the problem, which was known about. But in terms of reinforced corrosion and specifically uh, carbonation and chloride attack, those are virtually unknown. And, and then when I talk about a legacy issue, that's, that's really what I'm talking about. Um, even before 1990s, um, the majority of these structures that were being designed and built were really inadequate to deal with the harsh environmental conditions and specifically the dynamic loading that these these can, uh, structures go and take on a day to day basis. We all believe and, and know that obviously the marine environment is one of the most aggressive out there, but car parks are really up there if you consider the amount of loading that they have, the capacity. Um, and when we take on to uh, take on board the sort of um, common design features that that have that have resulted in this um, and this problem, you can see that they are really subject to very aggressive conditions in terms of corrosion. And a large proportion of these uh, these structures are now 60 to 70 year old. And considering that humans don't age that well, and we can't do as well as we did when we were younger, to maintain these structures becomes more and more difficult when it, terms, uh, when it comes to corrosion and we have to start looking at them in slightly different ways. But obviously this whole lack of understanding around uh, around corrosion led to a number of design features that have caused problems over the years. We have poor quality concrete, which obviously impacts all concrete structures, but then we have poorly designed construction and movement joints, poor water management, and typically very low levels of concrete cover to the steel reinforcement, which as we all know is the first line of defense against corrosion in concrete. Now I'm sure you've all seen some of these things, but I just wanted to make it a little bit more obvious. Let me just bring up my uh, pointer. Um, obviously the first slide here is a poor construction joint and, and poor joint. And as you can see, there are a number of cracks that are occurring on this structure. Now, obviously cracks and corrosion are best friends. Anything that can bypass the concrete cover and accelerate the rate in which chloride and moisture can get down to the steel is obviously going to increase the corrosion risk and obviously the level of deterioration. So again, the poor design of these features really does exaggerate the corrosion process. The centre picture here is an area of low concrete cover. Uh, and again, typically, um, I'm sure you've all been to car parks where you've seen this cover of less than half an inch is, is very common. And again, the lower the cover, the lower the protection, and then the faster the chloride gets to the steel or the carbonation gets to the steel, and that's going to accelerate the risk of corrosion over the long term. And then the photograph on the right here is an exaggerated example of water management. Obviously, we don't see car parks like this every day. However, it's just a point that Car parks do also go down as well as up in the air. Uh, and obviously, if you don't get your water management correct, then obviously that's going to be a, a problem. And the main problem being that water is the medium where chloride is transported onto concrete. It obviously dissolves into the concrete. The water evaporates, leaving chloride behind. And over time, that chloride builds up and eventually starts causing damage to the actual structure or concrete. Sorry, when I've got the point through, it doesn't allow me to move on. So is today we stand now, obviously chloride is, is well known and most is the most significant cause of reinforcement deterioration globally. But just as a, another fact of our knowledge and how it's changed rapidly in the past sort of like 20, 30 years, up until the late 70s in the UK, and I, I believe it was similar to the rest of the world, Chloride in um, admixtures were used to accelerate set time up until the late 1970s. So you can see that not only do we have environmental impacts that are going to impact the car parking structures, we also have the ability to cast in chlorides from day one. And that has a massive long term and legacy issue with, with a lot of our structures that we see. Now, the principal source of chloride coming in contact with, with car park structures is really deicing salts and then airborne chlorides in and around the marine environment. And we can we can break the deicing salts really into two categories that affect car parks. One, we obviously have in temperate environments. We have um, cars moving chloride and moisture from the outside into the car park and that gets distributed around uh, around the car park as the, as the cars move but we also have uh, the fact that 
um, parking structures tend to be public areas. So we have maintenance issues where we have people walking through the car parks. And as that, we have a health and safety issue where maintenance people will be spreading the ice and salt on the, on the, on the car park deck, like I say, in temperate areas, which are then going to lead to uh, more chloride being placed on the structure as well. So again, it's a bit of a two, two edged sword when it comes to de ice insults. This is a general comment, but because of the sort of the method normally of how chloride gets into these uh, into these car park structures, it's typically the first two levels of the car park where the entrance is located that that have the highest level of, uh, of corrosion risk. As you move further up and away from the entrance, that risk tends to reduce with time. And I'll show some examples of that later on in the presentation. So. I think it's I don't want to go into too much technical detail, but I think it's important to obviously um, set the scene in terms of chloride induced corrosion and why it occurs. As we say, we know when we put steel in concrete that steel doesn't naturally corrode from from day one if it's done properly. And the reason being that when we place steel in concrete, the pH, the alkalinity in the concrete, the cement content in the concrete actually creates a very thin but dense passive film. It's a very small but very dense film of corrosion products that forms and that film isolates the steel from the, from the concrete. So basically what you then have is the steel isolated from the concrete and it will sit that way for many, many years. But obviously we do now know, um, let me turn off this pointer a second. What we do now know is obviously chloride in particular is, is very good at breaking down this passive film. So when chloride enters the concrete, it virtually moves by time down to the surface of the steel and when it reaches a certain concentration it will break down the passive film and when it breaks down the passive film the steel then loses its protection and we get what we classify as an anode formed an anode is is scientific jargon for site of corrosion so where we get metal loss is what we classify as an anode and the anode is only half of the reaction we need two halves of the reaction to, for the process of corrosion to occur and the second one is what we classify as the cathode so the anode is the site of corrosion metal loss the cathode is the site of protection so for every anode we have a cathode on steel so some of the steel is corroding some of the steel is being protected in the same structure and when you combine the two together we obviously form what we, we typically see on structures now as rust. And the strange fact with rust, and I'll come to this again a bit later, is it's a good thing that it's it's 10 to 12 times more voluminous than the native metal. So we know that we include steel in concrete to, to give us a composite where we improve the tensile strength of, of concrete, because we know concrete is good in compression, but it's very poor in tension. So any buildup of stress on the inside of the concrete is not going to be well accepted by concrete, and that's what happens. We get this buildup of corrosion product, and it doesn't take a lot to actually cause cracking in the concrete. And those cracks then lead to more moisture, more oxygen, and more um, uh, chloride to get down to the steel. So you typically find when cracks start occurring on the structure, the rate of deterioration is exponential from, from that point. So here are just a couple of examples. Um, there's a bit of a story behind these and why I've shown them. They aren't just random um, photographs of deterioration on parking garages. But if you look at the top right hand side here uh, as what you can see, uh, basically this is a soffit um, corrosion that's occurring here. And what's happening is we have a joint, as you can hopefully see. I'll bring the pointer back out again. Um, we have a joint down here and we can see that water has leaked through. We can tell water has been leaking because also the, I don't know whether this is an anti-carbonation coating or just a general coating, but you can see that that has also failed because they don't like moisture in general. So water has been coming through and then you've got chloride contamination and then you have corrosion occurring in those areas. Typically, um, soffits tend to be away from the marine environment, especially more of a carbonation issue, so coatings tend to work well, but we have to pay particular attention when we have uh, joints and areas where we have water leakage coming through with time. This photograph on the right is a, is a, is a deck and you can see some very poor repairs that have been carried out on, on the deck. and. Normally that's a necessity. Again, these are public spaces and obviously trip hazards, broken ankles don't go down well with the public. So as owners and operators, 
you tend to find you have maintenance teams that operate around the car park and fill in any delaminations, remove loose concrete and fill them with whatever you have available that could be cementitious materials, it could be epoxies uh, and any resin type material. I've seen them all being used and we'll come to see later that that's while it's a necessity for speed, it's not the best thing you should be doing for for your structure long term. And on the bottom right, we have a, again the same picture that we saw before, but you can see here we have a repair that's been carried out in the past and then we've got exaggerated failure, um, which is what we classify as incipient anode, which I'll, I'll come on to in a while, but that's what we um, we typically see quite commonly and hopefully you've all seen that on some of your structures that you visit either personally or through work. And the bottom right picture here, I've included this because it's it's an important consideration with parking structures. Typically, if you've stood still on a parking structure for long enough, you'll realise that they move quite considerably uh, through vibration, through the movement of cars. And what you tend to find in some instances, and I've seen this personally, is the corrosion may start uh, and the delamination may start in a very small area, but as you get the vibration, you get the movement of the structure, those things propagate quite quickly and they can lead to very big, large delamination areas that may not be completely 100% attributed to the corrosion of the reinforcement uh, where it started, because I, I know this job well, um, but basically a lot of the steel here was in good condition. It was just the fact that it was hollow because the vibration of the structure had allowed that 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 delamination to occur uh, over time so it's just a few interesting um pictures of sort of types of deterioration that we see on car park structures now we all know that chloride is a problem um but obviously whatever structure we go on to we can't assess that through visual looking we have to do um testing to be able to determine what the level of chloride is, what the mode of failure is. And again, I sort of bat on this all the time. I bore my family, I bore engineers and the fact that you're better off spending as much money as you can on a proper investigation to understand the problem, where the, where the problem's occurring, how it's occurring, because if you don't, the high probability is that your repair strategy is not going to be sufficient for the life extension that you're looking for. And one of the most, most basic methods that we can do is analyse how much chloride is actually in the concrete. And we do this quite simply. Uh, we take powder samples at depth, so we call, uh, drill into the concrete at certain depth ranges. We collect the sample, we send that off to a laboratory and we can measure the amount of chloride in that sample. Obviously, we typically do a cover survey, so we look at the amount of cover on the steel at the same time because we need to relate the amount of chloride at depth with the actual depth of the steel. And by combining the two together, we can form a risk profile uh, across the structure if we take enough samples. Now here are, are sort of like the risk categories on the left hand side. I personally believe the best method of analysing chloride content is by comparing it to the, to the weight of cement. Obviously the cement is the main source of alkalinity of pH in the concrete and we all know um, that chloride and alkalinity are the two uh, two elements that fight against each other in a constant battle. Um, and at some point, the chloride overtakes the alkalinity and that's when corrosion occurs. So again, expressing the weight of some, uh, chloride against the weight of cement is, is, very, uh, is very useful and far more accurate than just the total amount of chloride per sample. But as you can see, Typically, as the concentration increases or the percentage increases, we get a greater risk of corrosion. On the right hand side is a, an example of uh, parts per million, which uh, some of you in North America may be more uh, familiar with. But as you can see that as we go deeper into the concrete here, obviously the level of chloride is reduced and in the majority of samples. So, for example, if our, our cover to our steel was one and a half inches, then you're pretty much below the threshold for two thirds of your samples. Only these two samples here were uh, were, were going to be above that threshold. However, if your um, steel was only a half an inch, then obviously you can see that nearly all of your samples are above the threshold. And at that level, you should be seeing deterioration occurring on site anyway. Now, what was interesting about this, I, I'm not claiming that I, I did this work, but I, someone told me about this and that's why I've included the slide is, what's interesting about these two, these were samples taken from cracks. Um, and what you can see is obviously the chloride concentration is much greater and much more level 
you don't get this great uh, a general decrease in concentration with depth. It's far more level and that's what cracks can do to accelerate the rate in which chloride concentrations build at depth within concrete. And again, sort of refers back to the, the slide I said before about construction joints and poor quality concrete that can exaggerate these, these corrosion risk problems. But it's just an interesting, an interesting slide to, to demonstrate the point. Now, one of the biggest problems with chloride contamination is one, obviously it causes corrosion, but secondly, we create a problem if we come and repair it without thinking or understanding that it is chloride that is causing us the problem on the site. And hopefully some of you have been aware of, of this incipient anode formation or ring anode formation. And basically it is an acceleration of deterioration when you carry out a repair. So in these two slides, you can see repairs that have been carried out and then the repair has broken down at the periphery. Somebody has come along and done another repair. Then it's broken down again, and then we've got another repair. And this accelerated um, deterioration of our repairs is a phenomenon known, like I say, as incipient anode formation or ring anode effect. And I just want to spend a bit of time to explain how that happens and why that happens when we carry out repairs to chloride contaminated concrete. So here it's very similar to the slide you saw previously, but now, We've removed the delaminated concrete. So this used to be our anode. This used to be the site of corrosion. And what we've now done is we've cleaned back. We've cut back behind the rebar. We've blasted the steel. We've cleaned it. We may have even primed the steel and coated the steel. And we've put back a nice, fresh, high alkalinity repair material. Now, this steel can be nothing other now than a cathode. It has no means of, of corroding. The passive film is strong, it's complete. So this is just going to be your cathode. And that's what we want when we carry out the repair. The problem we have is, it's virtually impossible to remove all chloride contaminated concrete. So what we now have is we have an imbalance set up between the patch and this concrete on the outside of the patch, the parent concrete. Now, this used to be a cathode. This used to be protected by the repair itself. This used to be the anode. This used to be the cathode. It's now swapped around in terms of probability. And when I say probability, so I'll, I'll have to get rid of the pointer again because it won't let me uh, move forward quick enough. But what we're setting up is a potential imbalance. There's a greater potential here for the steel to corrode on the outside than this steel. So we set a corrosion cell, we set a drive voltage where this will over time want to be an anode as opposed to a cathode. And that's what happens. We then with time build up these corrosion products on the outside of the patch. That leads to failure of the parent concrete and we have to come along and do a, another repair strategy. Now, the first use of targeted protection for galvanic anodes was to solve this problem. The people at Aston University, Dr. George Sergi, was asked to come up with a solution to, to this problem. In the past, zinc-based systems had been used and weren't very effective, uh, zinc-based paints. Um, so they looked at the problem and what they came up with was a solution that if we can keep the anode located within the patch repair itself, as you can see here, then we can have a metal, in, it, in our case zinc, which is more electronegative than the steel that's in the patch and also on the outside. So what happens is this becomes our anode and provides current onto this steel and this steel. And that what we, what we classify as cathodic prevention. We are preventing this steel on the outside of the patch to become corrosive and start corroding, which leads to that premature breakdown of the repairs itself. Now, this technology is, is not new. It's, it's been used for the past 20 years plus now, but the product itself has changed. I mean, there's been a massive evolution, but the principles remain the same. We have a, a, a piece of zinc. Let me bring my pointer back. We should sort this out, but anyway, sorry for the inconvenience. But basically we have a piece of zinc we have a conductor that's cast around, which allows the connection of the zinc onto the reinforcement. And then we have an activating mortar around it. Now the activating mortar is vitally important. It's what keeps the zinc active with time. If we place zinc straight into concrete, that zinc is going to passivate in a very short period of time and is not going to act as an anode. So having an activator is, is the most fundamental element past having zinc in the structure as well. Uh, but you need to have both of them for the system to, to, to work. Now, 
In terms of where we are now, again, the technology is very similar. We still have zinc, but now we have a higher surface area of zinc, and that really does increase the performance of the anode. It gives a far better level of protection to the steel. We've changed the connection detail to make it far faster. We have this one, one uh, wire system now, which is, is a lot, lot faster to install on site. We have more ergonomic design to allow the connection, and we also have changed the mortar to, to include a non-corrosive hum humectum, which keeps moisture at the anode. So again, a lot of things have evolved over the past sort of 20 years plus in terms of this technology, but realistically, um, it stayed very similar in terms of the fundamental principles. Now, targeted patch repair is really um, only a reactive process. It's like the base level of repair that you can you can carry out on structures. It's physically uh, protecting people from tripping from hazards and it's also trying to maintain some structural integrity um, and they can be various of, of sizes really they can be very small as you've seen or they can be very large but it is very targeted you can see the problem you come along you repair the problem and you walk away but that protection is really only limited to the repair and the boundary of that repair it is doing nothing for the rest of the structure in terms of corrosion risk really but again this sort of this sort of use of anodes in patch repairs has become very popular over the uh, over the past sort of 20 years and there's a lot of governmental agencies and, and engineers that use them now as standard practice around the world and it's probably the simplest and cheapest way to extend the service life of your patch repair that you can physically do so here are just some photographs of some installation of these type of anodes so obviously we can see here a patch interestingly uh, chloride is obviously notoriously bad for eating away steel so this area here would have been your anode and this would have been protecting a much larger area of steel here and obviously you've caused delamination which has caused the problem in this area but you can see you get large cross-sectional loss so from an engineer's point of view that's bad obviously that's really affecting the structural integrity there but obviously we have a chloride issue uh, and again, you can see it here from that cross-sectional loss of steel. But we'd come along, we'd mark out, we'd lance, we'd break out, uh, we'd cut behind the rebar to give a good repair, and then we'd square off edges, and then we replace the anodes. You can start seeing them now being placed at the periphery at a, at a set spacing there. Again, this is a larger picture of the same. It's a different shot, but you can see that the columns remain. So again, we have anodes going around the columns because again, they're going to be at risk. And then these islands of, of parent concrete that are remaining, again, are going to be at risk of incipient anode formation. Again, just another close up. Again, you can see far better now the anodes uh, being installed around the periphery of the repair. But again, as I said, this is only protecting this boundary. It's only protecting the parents probably four inches outside of the of the actual patch, but it's keeping that structural integrity of the repair in place for the long term, really. And typically with these type of anodes, you're looking up to 20 years worth of protection um, of, of from incipient anode formation or cathodic prevention in this instance. Obviously, then we have to reinstate. So once we've tied the anodes on, uh, we, we connect them to the steel, we make sure the continuity is correct, and then we come along and we reinstate with a, a, a cementitious material. It has to be a cementitious material because it has to be ionically conductive, but that could fall many ways. It could be pourable, it could be hand applied, it could be dry spray or shotcrete, it could be wet spray, um, it could be a variety, it could even be mass concrete pours, depending on the size of the repairs, but that really comes down to what the contractor is trying to achieve on site. But again, we reinstate Stated. And once we read and stated these anodes, once this is poured on, these anodes are then activated and then they're providing protection to the periphery of this of this repair. Again, it's not doing anything to the concrete over here or here. It's just maintaining the, uh, the integrity of the repair itself. I've included this one because this is this is a slight change in terms of a mental state when you're thinking about repair. In this instance here, we had a complete ramp removal. So the, the, the client removed all the chloride contaminated concrete, replaced all the steel, and from their mind, they thought during the early discussions that that would be fine. I haven't got a corrosion problem anymore. I can walk away. The problem we always have in this type of scenario is we're always bonding the new steel and the new deck or the new ramp into the old. So we still have chloride contaminated concrete at these column areas, these uh, 
um, these areas here and you can see them on this side as well so what you've got here though even though you've got new steel there's still a risk at this boundary of the of the repair or re replacement now as you can see on this one the steel density is is far more significant than what it was in the other photographs and you can see that we could still use the XP type anodes to achieve protection here, but we'd have to install so many of them because one of the design criteria and design principles that we have with galvanics is we have to have uh, um, the right quantity of zinc to steel surface area. It's one of the design parameters that we have to have. So while physically we could do it with the XP, we have other anodes on our range that are far more suited for these heavy um, heavy duty steel areas. It's on the same technology, it's still zinc, it's still an activator, it just allows us to include a lot more zinc into the system which gives us a, a better a performance when we have very high steel density. Now obviously you can see here that we have uh, epoxy coated rebar, um, rightly or wrongly, but basically what you have here is these are being connected to the bars that are going into the parent concrete. So again, these are being connected to these and these anodes then would provide protection here, but it's also going to give some protection to any holidays that you may have on the coating, which typically occur when you're using these type of materials on, on a job site. So I've, I've labelled this one as the hidden danger, I guess. The great thing we have, and it doesn't sound like it, but the great thing we have is that we can physically see the deterioration happening. It would be far worse from an engineer point of view and a structural point of view if corrosion was occurring underneath the concrete and we had physically no signs of deterioration of the steel. We would have far more failures on our structures than we do currently. So on, on one hand, we're very lucky that corrosion causes rust staining, it causes cracking and causes delamination. But the only problem with that is we only see it once it's reached a certain point. So we can't look at the rest of the concrete around the spores and say, well, are you at risk of concrete? Because we can't physically see it. And while we may have chloride there, it's not going to give us a great risk uh, estimation on a larger scale area, really. You'd have to take thousands and thousands of chloride samples, which is quite costly. It's timely and there are all the better non-destructive techniques out there that allow this, this process to take place. And I just wanted to spend a bit more time just on, on that one process, which is half cell potential mapping, full half cell potential mapping. It's a very quick a way of assessing corrosion risk. Again, it's a probability. It is not an absolute rate, uh, but again, you'll see that it's far more visual in nature and allows us to assess far better uh, corrosion risk over larger areas. So again, without going into too much detail, the principle is basically here we have a metal in a known solution of its ions which is basically a zero point if you want to think it's our reference point. This doesn't change and we connect this through a wire to a multimeter and then the other side of that is connected to the steel. Now the only thing that is going to change in the circuit is the condition of the steel. So as the steel becomes more corrosive or the environment becomes more corrosive, we're going to get a completely different voltage readout on our multimeter and as the ASTM that sort of helps us or guides us in terms of probability here as you can see. So we can go along this structure, take many readings in a grid formation and plot that out uh, and see the visual um, levels of corrosion that you may have or potential of corrosion over a structure. And as you can see here, we have these hot spot areas where we have to, uh, that we have higher risks of corrosion. Again, it's not a rate, it's a potential risk. And I look at this as saying if corrosion is going to occur in the next five to ten years, these are the areas that it's likely going to be. So we have to do all the things to these areas. We have to consider these areas when we're building up a repair scenario because we know they're going to cause us problems in the near to future term. OK, now I've included these next two slides just to illustrate the point I, I sort of mentioned earlier that corrosion risk reduces as you move further away from the entrance of the parking structure. And you can see here a full half cell potential map survey and you can see that you've got pretty much widespread um, corrosion risk occurring. And this is because it's the first level. This is where everything comes into the car park. You can typically see uh, runways and roadways here where the traffic is going along. Uh, you can sort of see that 
that etching so you can see where the cars are parked and where the most traffic is going and that's because obviously the cars are bringing in salt water with themselves and they're dropping it onto the concrete in the areas where they're highly trafficked but if we now use uh, look at the next level above you can see that already the rate of, of, of corrosion risk is reducing as we're moving further away from the entrance points and that will that will increase as you as you move further and further up so hopefully you can see that by carrying out this non-destructive testing, we can get a really good visual representation of corrosion risk over large areas. And typically parking garages are large areas. Now I've included this one as another project. You'll see it a bit later in the, in the in the presentation. But basically what we have here again is a half cell potential map survey. But at this time we've included also the delamination survey on top. And what you can see is what's left behind is a much smaller percentage of high risk concrete. So obviously we'd have to carry out these repairs anyway, but then it doesn't tell us anything else without the half cell potential map that this area is also at risk. And you can see that the level of repair is quite limited in these areas compared to these big white repair areas that are being carried out. So again, if we just did the repairs, put anodes in these repairs, we're not going to do anything for these high risk areas that are remaining. And again, that's what's so good about using multiple data sets together. It really allows us to build up a, a, a good picture of what's going on on the structure. So hopefully you can see from, from those half cell potential plots that corrosion is not uniform. It's going to be related to, like, say, heavy parking bays, heavy traffic ramps, movement day joints, for example. But really, once you take into the whole uh, concrete surface area, you're really looking at about 20 to 40 percent of the total area. And that's why this whole targeted approach is so uh, attractive is because we're not looking to protect everything with, with cathodic protection or corrosion prevention. We're trying to only use it where it needs to be used. And when we take the delamination into account also, that reduces even further to sort of 20 percent of the area. So it tends to be the most cost effective if we're looking in the sort of medium to, to long term. So typically Typically, we're looking for 20, 30 years. This sort of technique is really, really viable. And we're sort of seeing that that is that is what people are looking for. If you if you want 50, 60, 70 years further on, there are other ways of, of, of dealing with this type of protection. You're probably looking to more global protection with cathodic protection, maybe even impressed current cathodic protection. Uh, but obviously there is a cost element uh, involved uh, involved with that. But this target approach is becoming more popular over the years because people are understanding the risk far better by through doing testing on their structures. OK. OK, here's the next slide. So I just wanted to obviously make a, a point in the fact that obviously when we have repairs, we can actually tie anodes on the inside of the patches. When it comes to the discrete embedded anodes, anodes that we're going to place into sound concrete or sound parent concrete, obviously we have to change the design of the anode to allow us to do that. And here are just two examples of, of, of products that we, we, we have on our uh, range. Uh, I don't again, I don't want to go into too much detail. Uh, about them. Uh, but basically on the right hand side here we have what we call as Galveston Fusion uh, and this is the, probably the latest product that we have on our range. Um, it has an extended life so we're looking up to 30 years with, with this product. Uh, but basically what we are, we're combining impressed current cathodic protection and galvanic protection into a single anode. So this bottom section here as you can see uh, is a self-powered impressed current cathodic protection and we can design that in two ways. We can do a passivation um, so we use a very high current density to passivate the steel. Once that's completed, typically after 90 days, the XP, uh, the CC anode then takes over for the long term. So the pure galvanic anode takes over for the long term. Again, that's some, that's suitable. That's a, that's a newer product. But again, that's something that's been pushed quite heavily and used quite heavily now. On the other side here, we have the Galva Shield CC anode. Again, this this product is probably is coming close to 20 years in itself now. Uh, we have slightly less life on that, so it's about 20 years. But again, achieves the same sort of thing. We're looking to corrode to control the corrosion in the concrete that is uh, sound at the moment, but has that increased risk. And I just want to go through a couple of examples of where these these anodes 
loads have been been used. So this one is 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 one close to my heart. That's why I've included. It's in the UK. It's Lucy Street car park. At the time of construction, which was probably about uh, repair, sorry, it was about five six years ago. Now it was probably one of the largest car park repair structures that we'd been involved in. And you'll recognise some of the photographs and, and pictures from the uh, from the presentation so far. So this is the same. Um, picture that you saw before. So we have the half cell potential plant, we have the delamination survey, but what we've also got now is um, the repair. We've got the anodes included as well. So you can see the blue uh, dots represent the Galveston XP, the tie down anodes into patches, and the red anodes represent in this instance Galveston CC4 anodes that were included in the high risk areas. So you can see that it's a targeted approach to where the corrosion is going to physically uh, be. Here again, you've seen some of these photographs, but they're, they're all related to, to this project. So you can see here we have the XP anodes again on the periphery of the repair. I don't think we need to spend too much time on that. And then we have obviously the mark out of a delamination area first off, and then we have the position of the Galva Shield CC anodes being placed. Now you'll see that they don't represent a standard grid, and that's because before we mark out these anodes, we need to know where the steel is running. Obviously, we do not want to drill down and, and cut any steel. So again, these anodes are now following the pattern of the, of the steel itself within that grid. So these anodes are going to be protecting these larger areas, but you can see that it's not protecting over here because this was deemed low risk as part of the half cell potential map. Obviously, we have to make a hole um, for, for these anodes to be bedded into. Again, there's multiple ways of doing it. There's rock drilling, there's standard drilling, there's also coring. All of them are used um, depending on where you are in the world. But again, we have to make a hole. And then we set the anodes out. So we we bed the anodes using the cementitious mortar into the hole, and then typically we link them together in strings of 20. Typically in this instance, there were strings of 10, I believe. But basically what we have here is we have a connection directly to the steel, and then we have a wire that interconnects these anodes, and then again, back to the steel. And as soon as we connect it to the steel, you're getting global protection in the area that you can see the anodes are placed. Interested on this photograph, you can also see that the spacings around the columns are a lot tighter. Again, that's because we have a lot more steel for puncture shear protection, so we have to put more anodes in those areas. And as we move further away, uh, you can see that the spacing increases, and that's because we're designing it to the level of steel that's in that particular area. This is another car park. This was done, I think it was the beginning of this year. Covid's messed everything up, so I'm, I'm a bit all over the place in terms of the of timelines. But basically, this is a uh, in Germany. It's one of the Audi manufacturing um, car parks. But I've included this one specifically because this is a new structure. This is not an old car park with a legacy that we talked about at the beginning. But still, galvanic anodes, and again, these were CC anodes, were used in a targeted approach to a specific problem that they faced on this on this car park. So again, I said it was a fairly new car park, but they have this water management trough uh, area here where water was going into. But what they were seeing was an increased corrosion risk and corrosion occurring at this boundary here because obviously water chloride, it was accelerating the corrosion of this and therefore they wanted to do something about it. So basically, um, I'm pretty sure you can physically see what they did is they distributed anodes all along this 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 edge here, connected it to the steels, and then that was there then to protect all of this area. So again, very, very targeted, but very, very much a new new concrete, not old concrete. So even though we, we talk mainly about repair of old infrastructure, this is an example where targeted protection can also be done and completed on um, on new uh, new builds as well. And that's just the final money shot, I suppose, of the uh, of the completed project. This is a another another project again, um, just on a fusion anode system. In this instance, you can see again a car park deck here. We have various failures and repairs being carried out on here, so the decking system has failed in some areas, and we've got height and corrosion risk in areas. And again, this is one where we carried out a half cell potential map again. You can see the delamination areas here in white and hatched, but you can see that there are areas, especially here, 
and around here where the amount of delamination was quite low, but the risk still remained. So again, hopefully you've got the gist from now. What we've done, we came along, we installed anodes into these high risk areas and into the repairs. In this particular uh, instance, it was Gaussian fusion. But again, the amount of area that we're talking about here is only a few hundred anodes. We're not talking about thousands of thousands of anodes, but it's proportional to the risk that you can physically see upon that structure itself. Again, just some installation shots. Again, nothing, uh, nothing too serious there. Obviously, this is just a photograph of them making the chase in between the two anodes. Um, here we have a uh, the physical electrical connection between the loop wire or the feeder wire and the actual green wire that comes from the anode itself. And obviously, they're then run and connected to the steel reinforcement. So. Coming to the end of my sort of presentation, I just wanted to reflect on some of the things that have been playing on my mind uh, for the past few years and also looking into the future where things are going with parking structures. Now, the first one is sort of like a, a retrospective thinking of, of what typically happens. And with, with parking structures, as we've said, they tend to be attached to commercial businesses. So owners and operators are really focused on the visual aesthetics for getting people into their into their structures, into their buildings, into their office apartments, rentals, uh, but also from health and safety, some lighting, making sure that people feel safe. Um, so again, there's a big focus typically on waterproof coatings just because they make the car park and the parking garage look far more attractive to, to the users of it. The problem we, we have with waterproofing uh, systems is they typically um, state that they, they they can stop corrosion through the reduction of water and and while that is that is a true point um, they, they do reduce the amount of moisture that you get in the car park the probability especially if you have chloride contaminated concrete is you're very unlikely to reduce the uh, moisture level enough to stop corrosion it may reduce it down but it's definitely not going to stop it and one of the main reasons for that is um, chloride is actually hydroscopic in nature so when it's in concrete it actually holds on to moisture so to physically have an impact, we have to really reduce the moisture level, the RH below 40% before we're going to start seeing some real reduction in corrosion rates. But if we don't and we just rely upon the waterproofing membrane, there's a high probability that those high risk areas that we haven't done anything with, um, with just a waterproofing membrane is going to carry on corrosion and that's going to lead to localised repair of the coating which is going to give you a maintenance issue itself. So we've seen a massive move towards this, this holistic approach of using waterproofing systems for general low to moderate risk of corrosion and then targeted galvanic protection where we have the most extreme corrosion risks and high risk areas of, of deterioration into the future and both of them work holistically together to extend the life of the structure and typically like I say with with galvanic systems and especially with the fusion system we're looking anywhere sort of 20 to 30 years worth of, of protection then. The next point is really a forward looking um, thing, something that's been playing on my mind. I mean, we all hear about carbon loading being carbon neutral and big pushes towards electric vehicles. Um, I know I'm talking to a, a largely North American audience, I guess, so I, I'm, I'm going to admit that I have an electric car. I'm in the UK, but I have an electric car. And it's something that's been playing on my mind uh, for, for quite some time is the fact that I, in the UK, I can't even go over a, a number of bridges in the UK because they're historical bridges. They aren't load capacity is quite low. And the, and, the, and the cars are literally two and a half ton. It's not a big car. And typically you're looking at 30, 40 percent heavier than the average or the same size fossil fuel car. Now, when these structures and in historical structures were uh, were built, they weren't thinking about this massive increase on weight of structures. And it's OK having one or two of these cars on the car park. The reality is over the next sort of 10 years, we're going to see more and more of these going onto the car parks. The dynamic loading and the loading stresses that we're going to be applied on these car parks is going to be considerable. And we all know that when we have higher wear, we have higher weights, more dynamic loading, that also leads to increased deterioration. Um, one, obviously, we've got to make sure that the steel is is able to do that and the car park is able to, uh, to, to hold that capacity or that new capacity. 
Um, but obviously we've also got to make sure that the steel remains there. And I really do see um, a change in terms of, uh, of having to use structural strengthening in addition to cathodic protection or corrosion prevention and corrosion control methods to really make sure that we, we maintain the structural integrity of our, of our parking structures as we move towards this new status quo. Let's say it's just a, a my, something in my mind, something that's been going around in my mind, but again, I wanted to sort of give as part of the presentation a little bit of forward thinking um, of, of where I see the next sort of problems and the next engineering challenges that may uh, may be occurring in the next sort of five to ten years anyway. So again, that's that's everything for me. I'll pass you back over to to Scott, and I'm sure we'll have some time now for some questions. Absolutely, thanks, Dave. Yes. I like that um, you uh, you took the, uh, the the kind of the wide view on the industry overall because we do have a lot of parking assets out there that are that are, um, uh, are, are are deteriorating and uh, we need to address them. So um, lots of questions. <laughs> wow. Here we go. Uh, um, so where, where to begin here? Uh, well, first and foremost, uh, our good friend Bert from Belgium has a, has a personal question for you. Uh, Dave, what is the best cheese for Christmas? My personal favorite is Gorgonzola. I've got mine on order for Italy. Yeah. You hear that, Bert? Gorgonzola is the answer. Awesome. Um, okay, now on to more business business questions. Um, for chloride con content by weight of cement, this is a question from Mark. For chloride content by weight of cement, do you determine weight of cement from petrographic testing or other analysis? It really does depend on how um, anal you want to get. Most people use 15% as, as a general uh, rule of thumb. The best test houses actually do through petrographic measure the amount of cement material there. You can do titration on it as well to get an idea, but yeah, the, the, the best the best test houses are going to actually uh, calibrate it against the actual cement content there. But a lot of people just use 14 to 15% cement. Perfect. Uh, okay, question from Raj. Um, do you recommend that the steel be coated with epoxy before concrete gets installed? I think people fall into two camps on here. I'm in the camp that um, it would help purely because obviously you, you want the current from the anode to go outside of the patch in the in the first point. So I'm going to give you the technical answer. I'm also then giving give you the rational answer of use on site. So technically, yes, if you can limit the service area of steel in the patch, you're going to physically use more of your current to go outside of the patch re in reality. So you, you 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 do get a benefit from using um, proper barrier coatings on the on the steel. The problem and risk you always have is I've seen many times that people overcoat the wires, they overcoat the anode, and obviously you're then stopping the anode from working. So it's a, it's a tile between risk of the anode not being installed properly and the coating stopping the anode working versus do you really need it? Um, so I think you'd have to really seriously think whether you really need that coating on that structure. Maybe if you've got very low concrete cover and you're in a marine environment, for example, and you know that chloride is going to get down to the steel in the short term, then maybe a coating would be a good idea, but it might also be a good idea to put anodes throughout that patch as well to make sure that you've got protection for the long term. Because the problem with coatings is obviously you've got a very small anode and a very big cathode because you've coated most of the steel. So what happens is you drive corrosion through the holidays in the coating, which is one of the, the negative sides of, of most coatings really. Awesome. So uh, Randy Smith is asking a uh, very common question. We hear this quite a bit. What happens uh, to the zinc as it protects the reinforcing steel? Does it dissolve and leave a void or does it oxidize and swell up similar to rust? I'm with you. No, it's a good question. I mean, I would refer everybody to look at the 20 year review paper that, that has been published because I think it does show what happens to, to zinc over the long term. So we've physically taken anodes out at 10 years, 15 years and 20 years. But basically what happens is obviously the zinc corrodes, so it shrinks, it gets smaller and smaller. And what tends to happen is those corrosion products supersaturate out into the gap. Obviously, we always need an ionic contact between the zinc and the mortar. So we need the corrosion products to fill the gap that's left behind. But the beauty of using alkaline activated anodes, and it's the most fundamental element of the anode itself, is 
We use lithium hydroxide, which creates this environment, but we consume the lithium hydroxide because it stops the corrosion products being expansive. It stops the corrosion products blocking the surface. So you can see, physically see them through, um, through analysis that they are moving away from the, the surface of the zinc with time. So they won't cause an expansion. They won't cause blocking at the surface of the anode. And, and it's, it's the reason why alkali activation is by far the most superior form of, of activation. Now, if you were using a halide activated system like bromide or chloride, that's far worse in terms of in terms of expansive corrosion products, but also they don't go anywhere uh, and they end up increasing the resistance to the anode and you tend to find a, a significant drop in um, current with time. But yeah, we have to deal with the corrosion products and again, alkali activation, I believe to be the most superior method of doing that. Okay, well said. Um, Chris has a question about half cells or corrosion potential. So what equipment or what equipment setup do you need to prepare a full garage half cell heat map shown in your presentation? Does the equipment automatically generate the visual output, the, pl the plot that you, you showed, or does um, do they need to be manually created based on numerical readings? It depends on how cheap you are. <laughs> if you want to <laughs> make method possible, you can buy all the components individually, you can take the readings, you can plot them out, and you can use software like Surfer, even Excel, older versions Excel, you can produce contour plots on. Um, but obviously that's the cheapest method. And all of those, and, and like the flute multimeter, the reference cells, you can buy them from, from, from many, many places, and they're quite common. Um, you can also buy equipment that does it all for you. Um, so the ProSec material, would, I'm, I, I'm thinking from a European perspective, but I'm sure, Scott, you might be able to help me from North America, but certain equipment will, um, there's wheels, so you basically wheel the reference cell over the surface and it logs readings at a set, uh, a set distance that you set, and then it plots it all out for you. So again, it's a lot more expensive, um, probably, probably close to, let's say probably six to 7,000 US. For that type of system but again it depends on how much money you want to spend okay chris if you have more questions about that feel free to get in touch with uh with with uh, dave or myself and we can help you out there uh tony has a question what uh at what point age of the structure number of previous repairs ratio of uh square footage of uh, areas with high corrosion uh to areas with no little corrosion like these are the metrics um, do you feel the cost of repairs end up being similar to the cost of demolition and rebuilding? Like, where's that trend? Where's that inflection point where repair is still better than than replacement in terms of cost? I mean, the issue we're going to have at some point is obviously you're going to have to justify that against your carbon loading. That's that. That's where the next point of call is coming. Really, it's like yes, it may be cheaper to do it, but we all know that cement is probably one of the worst materials for for generating carbon that you can physically use. So, I feel that in the next sort of like twenty over the next ten twenty years, you, you, it's going to be harder and harder to justify demolition versus trying to keep what we have. Um, and I think people. I don't know how the federal system works over there and things, but I would imagine there's going to be incentives for keeping. So I think that question is going to be really, really difficult um, to, to, to sort of answer. I think it also comes down to a commercial aspect. If you're knocking down a car park next to a shopping mall or shopping entity and then nobody's got anywhere to park, then that's going to have a significant impact on the revenue of that of that commercial entity, which again, so I, I know I've sort of negated that and not really answered the question. I think it really did depend upon the situation that you have. I would say you can always do it. Um, and if you can repair it, then I, I think that's always the best method. But sometimes you physically can't. And if, if every metric that you're looking at or matrix you're looking at leads to demolition, then that probably is the right right sort of method, especially if there's no way of extending the life or the loading capacity or whatever it may be to, to fulfill your needs into the into the future. Two options you always have available to yourself is status quo and complete replacement. <laughs> Um, two more questions really quick uh, because we're at time here. Uh, Joe, Joey was asking, um, at, the green, at the green lines, does the epoxy fill the saw, uh, the saw cuts where the, uh, the wires go in between the anodes uh, okay. and, and, and cover uh, the, the connecting wires and reinforce, into the reinforcing? Like, is it epoxy or is it cementitious? 
You can use either. I've seen, I mean, uh, I've seen both. I mean, typically it's cementitious, I would say, nine times out of ten. It's cementitious because that's the cheapest material, cheaper material you can use. Epoxy is quite expensive. But I've also seen, especially on, on car park decks, where uh, they're going to lay a, uh, a, a decking membrane on top, and they're very concerned when they come along and they scabble uh, to prepare the surface that they, if they use a cementitious material that they're going to actually rip it up and then cause damage. So I've seen in instances where they have used much stronger epoxy type materials to make sure that the, the wires uh, and everything else stay intact when they're doing the preparation for decking systems. Okay. The, the, news either. the main thing is making sure that the anode is embedded fully in a cementitious material. We can't use epoxies or any insulating material when we're bedding the anode into the hole in the concrete. That has to be cementitious. Okay, perfect. Okay. Actually, you know, we're at time. I, I'm not going to uh, ask any more questions here. We have a bunch that are still unanswered though. So I'll just say is that if um, if you have another question that we didn't answer or we just want to get in touch, this is uh, Dave's contact information and he would love to, he'd love to speak with you. His email address is there as well as his office number. Uh, and again, just mind the time zone because he is in the UK. <laughs> uh, we're closing down the end here. So uh, the next up after after this in the new year in 2022 is uh, evaluation repair uh, and protection of unbonded post tensioning in parking structures with Mike Kernan from Vector Construction. Uh, you can register now. It's up on the website at wesavestructures.info. And then on February 9th, uh, we have structural strengthening with fiber reinforced polymers with uh, Andrew Brecker, also from Vector Construction. Um, so these guys are both uh, very experienced in these two fields, and I encourage you to, uh, to register if, if you're interested. Um, this brings us to the close of our uh, webinar today. Dave, thank you again for spending the time with us both uh, this morning or this morning my time and, uh, and this afternoon uh, and sharing your expertise and experience with us. It was a very interesting presentation. Thank you again. Thank you all for listening and spending the time with us. Thank you. And thank you all for joining us again for another webinar Wednesday. This closes off uh, 2021. I uh, hope you have a wonderful holiday season with, with your, uh, your family. You stay safe. And uh, when you get back in the new year, go save some structures. Thank you. <laughs>